Welcome to the SW7 Academy podcast with myself, Sam Warburton, and head coach, Chris Toombs, and we will teach you about all the elite behaviors and training methods that you need to know to build you into the best possible athlete. Just a quick word about our sponsors, Tramshed Tech. Tramshed Tech is a collaborative community where startups scale up, a platform for growth supporting the tech, digital, and creative industries. Like SW7, it's a community made up of high performers where having a growth mindset is key. Tramshed Tech can help you on your journey whether your business needs space to work, skills training, or business support services. Their award-winning Startup Academy is open for registration for pre-start or early stage businesses. Tramshed Tech are currently expanding to new locations in Wales, including Cardiff, Newport, Barry, and Swansea. So if you're an entrepreneur looking for space to work, business support, or skills training, head to tramshedtech.co.uk or at Tramshed Tech on social media to find out more. Okay, so rest and recovery. So this is arguably as important as training. And it sounds a bit counterintuitive because you're not doing anything, but actually rest is so important. Is rest and recovery or a lack of one of the biggest mistakes that you see, particularly in younger trainers? Massive. I think it goes back to when we first met and I think you'd done 30 out of 31 days of training before you came into the Blues Academy. That. I actually Thinking, got that written back. Have you? Yeah. I've Thinking got, more is better. Yeah. I went, it was yeah. a Christmas off yeah. and we had three weeks off at Christmas. I went to the gym every day, apart from Christmas Day, because they didn't open at Christmas Day. And I remember telling you, thinking it was going to be impressive. And you were like, no, mate. Well, <laughs> yeah, this is, no. yeah, this is, this is well, great. You like the work ethic, but yeah. no, let's try Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Work ethic, unbelievable. But ultimately, and this is something I'm having a lot of conversation with young players at the moment and continue to have with, with players of professional level, which is the rest and recovery element is actually absolutely vital. Funny enough, I had a conversation with a player literally over the last couple of days, genuinely, where I've said, however you chop up your training week, I want you to have two full recovery days. And I mean by full recovery days, we'll dive into that a little bit deeper. But I think going back full circle to training schedule without a shadow of a doubt adaptation occurs when you're not training training is the stimulus adaptation is what happens after you've done your training and you've had your stimulus and i think a lot of people look at our programming my programming you know and go is that it Hmm. but ultimately if you layer all of these training units together for an extended period of time like we say there's no overnight sensational you know miracle results it's going to be speed strength power endurance repeatability all of these physical qualities you know the jigsaw is 100 pieces is 100 pieces training for physical prowess maybe 10 pieces then you've got recovery pieces you've got rugby practices pieces you've got lifestyle as pieces you've got your family life you know that that jigsaw is what keeps us coming back to try to provide solutions for players time and time again, because one size doesn't fit all. And I know we're gonna dive into recovery modalities and some things that you like doing as a player, some things that have scientific validation, but also things like compression garments, which from the research don't seem to be effective from a physiological standpoint, but psychologically wearing recovery um, tights used to be a really popular modality for players. So if they like wearing them, I know we've just gone straight into it, but if they like wearing them and they feel psychologically like they've recovered as a result of wearing them, is that a, an effective modality? I say yes. So the placebo even, effect. Placebo yeah. effect. Even if the science doesn't validate the effectiveness of that particular modality, the player feels better. The, f- the player feels like they've got more energy. Well, that's a win-win. So ultimately they are recovering. And I think a lot of the things that we might dive into, for me, might not have scientific validation, but they have a psychological regeneration effect. And I think that the placebo or the the psychological recovery is as important as physiological recovery. And I think they're massive and they're massive. But it goes back to, for me, get your scheduling right, get your dosing right on any given day, and that gives you the best chance. And I know we talk big rocks. Nice, yeah. So that's kind of like the old prevention is better than cure, isn't it? We're getting scheduling right. So what what would be, if a a player said, right, what are the three main things I need to do for my recovery? What would you say? I mean, sleep, 
Yeah. Hydration, nutrition. I think those three big rocks, I mean, there's a guy in the NFL called Buddy Morris who's done 37, maybe 40 years now as an NFL strength coach. Gnarly old thing, 60 plus years old. But nail those three fundamentally. I think we always talk about fundamentals, whether it's training or whether it's nutrition, recovery and all those things. Sleep non-negotiable. We know the science is telling us that seven to nine hours, maybe sometimes more if you can, depending on your lifestyle, of course. But sleep, you know, Big time. There's, a, there's a really famous coach in America, Eric Cressy, who, you know, again, the science validates this. For every hour you go to bed before midnight is almost worth two. It's not worth two, but it's almost worth two. There's a load of technology as well now, isn't there, with your aura rings, your whoop bands, all these type of things that are helping players or helping people understand sleep and its value and its importance in recovery. But sleep, without a doubt, non-negotiable. That should be an absolute primary recovery uh, modality, if not the number one. Um, nutrition in and around training, fueling training. We get a load of questions on the, pot, on the, on the story on Instagram around um, what's the best you know, nutrition. Yeah. Ultimately, there's a low, again, a bit like modalities of training, you know, there's a ton of diets. I don't. I don't consider. Like it, it's I not exactly. Right, yeah. I'm the same as you. Fuel for performance ultimately, and then if you've got a secondary goal, i.e., someone asked me yesterday about body fat. If you want to be lean, well, eat to maintain a level of leanness, and ultimately that means you've got to modify your fuel intake. Let's not, like you say, let's not call it a diet. I don't fancy that. The fueling's uh, nice. I like the fuel. Fueling, yeah. Fuel for performance fuel for optimum performance and that's the big rocks of that would be carbs proteins fats you know vitamins and minerals through the micronutrients your antioxidants mm -hmm. your fruits your vegetables yeah. you know a, a balanced diet ultimately yeah. i mean i do think nutrition is still and it's not my real wheelhouse it's obviously strength and conditioning but they go hand in hand nutrition is i still think an underserved uh, performance variable in even in pro sport there are some programs I, I know a couple of mates of mine who work outside of rugby in in performance sport really really do spend a lot of time around nutrition and how important it is and I think it's of real high value I genuinely do and I think we leave a lot of performance gains on the table or off the table sorry but I think you and I both know you've seen the the guys in in your pro playing days who think that you can eat chips every day because you're burning it off but is that really the fuel that optimizes? It's a bit like you were saying about, well, we said about Gavin Henson and the couscous, the chicken breast, the greens. Yeah. That's the fundamentals that you need. Yes, you need good fats, you need you know, high quality protein, you need good quality carbs to, to fuel your performance, whether that's training or playing. And it makes you feel better. Yeah. Eating good food. I mean, we both like a bit of chocolate, a pizza every now and again. Couldn't eat eight slices, mind. <laughs> <laughs> only four yeah. but um you know i know that's a reference for a <laughs> past week. episode but um you know the realities for us they're huge those big rocks for me sleep nutrition hydration are the cornerstones and a friend of mine says it all the time don't worry about your percussive massage guns your cryotherapy your hot cold contrast even if you're not getting those three fundamentals in place as standard every day and as you said once before luckily for you sleep and hydration don't cost anything <laughs> well, exactly. if you're living in a not in a third world country no but absolutely if you're like majority clean, people listen i imagine yeah. clean water. drinking water and yeah getting your head down on your pillow yeah. free if you you make a conscious choice as a player or a developing athlete do you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night and get off your phone and all the social media distractions and all the other things that go along with owning a mobile phone in this day and age i know it sounds a bit like a dinosaur but That'd ultimately i know there's a lot of education for players nowadays in and around social media use mm -hmm. psychologically and physiologically that not the there's a level of damage. I don't know what that quite means in terms of a real kind of number, but ultimately we all know if you're playing computer games till three in the morning, if you're on your phone, you know, whatever, scrolling and just mindlessly kind of just activating your brain, but not doing anything constructive to unwind, that has implications on your athletic prowess without a shadow of a doubt. So, so yeah, if you prioritize sleep and make a conscious effort to get an extra hour a night, Again, it's like everything we talk about. If you're consistent with that, let's see how your body feels and responds to training and you know your effective kind of physical development yeah. if you 
if you give yourself that opportunity to get that extra hour. I know the difference between going to bed at 10 and 11, oh. consistency consistently is massive for me personally, even now at my kind of age. And I used to, in the, in the blues days, I used to go to bed at nine o'clock at night. Really? I yeah. feel great, but I was also up at five, six o'clock in the morning every day. Mm. So ultimately you've got to, and now we've, you know, you and I are both parents, you've got kids that, you know, don't necessarily give you the luxury of, you know, a full night's sleep very rarely these days. Yeah, but the reality is that's the conversation that players have to have with themselves as well. Yeah. If you've got a young family, you know there's going to be sleep issues and sleep disturbance. So what do you do? Yourself well, you've got to, four nights a week. You've, yeah. But you've also that's got to cover all these bases, haven't you, where, okay, I know my sleep's going to be impacted upon, so I need then to make sure my nutrition and my hydration are bang on and some of the other potential uh, modalities as well, which we'll dive into. No, so you're, you're saying things there because, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of so many examples. I'm, when I was playing, I remember like, I say to my wife when we had a, a newborn, which I found really difficult um, as a professional player having a newborn, I'm like, right, four nights of the week, I'm going to be selfish and I have to sleep. Tuesday is a big day, Thursday is a big day, Saturday is a big day, and actually Saturday night, from a recovery perspective, they're the four nights I have to sleep and I'm going to go off into the spare room and I've got to get my eight hours in but then the other three nights I pull my weight you know and I help out yeah. so no, totally. you need to have that balance you know, yeah. if you are in a relationship with kids on the sleep thing because I, I, those three pillars are fundamental there was a time where we were going out to Poland to do the cryotherapy that you remember yeah. before Wales had their own cryotherapy centre and we finished the game for Cardiff on the Saturday night and there was, we could either fly out to Poland that night. So like I say, a, a 10.30 flight from Cardiff, you know, say we had a, an afternoon game on a Saturday, fly from 10.30 to Cardiff, get into Poland, you know, one o'clock, but we can get a cryotherapy session in at one o'clock and we can get one in at say nine o'clock in the morning. So the coaches said, right, we can do this and you get two extra cryotherapy sessions in, or you can just fly out mid afternoon Sunday, get there Sunday evening, just do some cryo Sunday evening, ready for Monday training. And we all went, oh my God, option two, 100%, stay in Cardiff, get a proper night's kip, sacrifice two cryotherapy sessions because a full night's kip is way more important than two cryotherapy sessions. Yeah. So it's kind of like the nutrition thing that you say, um, people say about best supplements and we're like, well, we're food first. Yes. It's a very similar thing. So you do food first, supplements is the five, 10% on top. Correct. You don't actually technically need, you know, some things like creatine are great, but protein wise, Get your food sorted first, then you can do supplements. It's like this, get your sleep, hydration, and nutrition sorted first, then you can look at your secondary modalities yeah. and stuff. Um, also as well on the sleep thing, we got a load of blog posts now on, on the website and even injury prevention goes up. Yeah. Um, the, the chances of or the chances of getting injured can go up yeah. you know, with sleep, a lack of sleep. Sleep deprivation and high academic stress. So those who are listening are kind of in either schools, colleges, universities. The more stress you have outside of training, the greater your, your potential incidence of injury. So ultimately from that point of view, yeah, high academic stress or lack of sleep are two things that contribute and like you say, the science validates that as well. Your injury prevalence is higher with, lack, with less sleep. So ultimately that should be a red flag for most players of any level sleep should be a priority to minimize that risk because uh, as we both know stepping on the field there's a risk of injury of course because of collision but ultimately you want to try and dampen that as much as you can and minimize your exposure to injury prevalence by looking after yourself off the field and that's something yeah. that's huge i think when we're talking injuries people want to say well that, that that's not right because if somebody runs into you and you get the wrong body angle you're going to get injured we're talking probably more like your soft tissue injuries, soft tissue it, yeah you know? so, muscle pulls yeah, tears yeah. absolutely i think that's the thing about hydration which is really i yeah. think this is this is the one that i always use an analogy being a guy who's grown up in south africa about biltong if you think about biltong as a dried meat so you think that as your muscle is dry yeah. it's much easier to tear you try and tear biltong yeah. easy you try yeah, to tear you try and tear a steak which is hydrated meat, yeah, nice. which you haven't cooked. You mm. try and tear a steak in half with your bare hands, no chance. Yeah, you true. try and you can you can tear biltong because it's dry. Yeah, that's that's the point. best analogy I've used in yeah. in terms of a muscle being hydrated and functioning optimally versus a dry muscle, which is a dangerously kind of susceptible to tear. So that's that's the kind of you know yeah. um, example I use on that front. I, I go into a specific example of nutrition before you go on to sort of secondary modalities. So say like. After a game, I imagine there's probably some youngsters thinking, well, what do I do after a game then? So just an example, what I used to love doing with the national team or whoever, 
was we get back into the change room and um, they came up with this really good, um, it was like a high protein, high carbohydrate shake, obviously to refuel the glycogen, get the protein in, but there would be loads of things like um, like concentrated cherry and goji berries and loads of different types of berries for all the antioxidants. So it's like high protein, high carbohydrate, high antioxidant shake, which you just got in straight away. Because yes. so, obviously when you're playing, you've got to try and reduce inflammation and all that stuff on top of other things. Yeah. And then say another hour, two hours later, because that's quite fast digesting, then you'd have you know your big sort of chicken, rice, vegetable meal. Yeah. Once I'd done those two things, and then I got good sleep in, make sure you get in some electrolytes or water. You know, there's nothing magical about no. that, but that's probably for me with, with, with a good night's kip. And sometimes that did require some some sort of sleeping aids to help yeah. me get to that point. Sure. Um, that, that I wake up on a Sunday, that is the, the best thing. So I'll just give a quick example. No, that's, I mean, that's a great example. I know nutrition is basically not either of our wheelhouses, but like we said before, the the nutrition and the and the performance side go hand in hand. But that is a great example because I think there's two things that players make. I mean, granted, you had a bit of access to some pretty cool um, novel at the time supplementation. I love Ch- Cherry Active. I love yeah. really. I mean, I, I know that's a specific brand of. I know that PAS now make yeah. a cherry product of their own, which is pretty much the same. But ultimately, I think people forget there's a window of opportunity, and I know we're going to talk about the 30 minute anabolic window after training, which we're going we're, to. It's, after it's this, debunked. Yeah. It's yeah. debunked. But I think. There's two things that can happen after a game. What you've just provided from an example standpoint is amazing. You've got high protein, high carb to literally start that initial repair almost instantly, which after a game is, as we both know, you know that is an optimal window to recover well. Mm-hmm. But you've also added that anti-inflammatory piece with your tart cherry yeah. or your goji berries or your antioxidants, whatever other, you know, you've now got collagen, which is, an, yeah, a, which is a kind of more popular supplement to cover along with that for regeneration of tendons and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So you've got that, which I know that most pro teams are providing a, a shake, which also essentially helps with hydration straight away as yeah, well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, you've also got a lot of people who've got who've got a high level of caffeine ingested pre-game. Yeah. So in the evening games, or even in the afternoon games for that matter, you know you're going to have sleep interruptions. So you should even be more wary around what to eat after a game. But also I know of pro teams who have been incredibly successful who also look at that window after a game, bearing in mind you've, you've burned thousands of calories, you've... Um, taken a lot of contact which is also very very debilitating from a you know nutritional glycogen standpoint and also hormonally Mm. I still don't really know if we know enough about the hormonal kind of uh, stress that collision really brings I know there are people who've measured a, a, a number of these kind of KPIs or metrics but the reality is are you going to slam a pizza then a thousand calories worth of pizza which also for most people cheese is a relatively inflammatory food so are you going to add a layer of inflammatory kind of nature to your to your kind of playing exposure? Or are you going to do what you did at the front end of the example, which was high carb, high protein, high antioxidant recovery drink, chicken or, you know, high quality protein and high quality carb that you've eaten, rice, sweet potato, whatever those mm-hmm. other options, maybe green vegetables and another, another layer of kind of... Um, I guess, anti-inflammatory slash nutrient dense kind of recovery food to optimize that recovery. We haven't even talked about all these other peripheral modalities yet. We're just talking about the the, the bang for your buck basics. Or are you going pizza and beer, which I actually think will knock your recovery back an extra day. So if you're thinking about test match rugby, Lions series, Six Nations, where you've got another game next week of real high intensity and high quality, you've got to... Again, it goes back to these elite behaviours that we always reference. Are you wanting to, pro- to provide yourself the best opportunity to perform well again next week? Or are you leaving something on the table which is going to be, I'm going to now need, if I live the pizza and beer life, and don't tell me, you know, we're not saints here, everyone never now again has yeah. a beer. But ultimately, are you, are you refeeding effectively or are you just asking your body to take an extra day to recover? or an extra day and a half because you don't, you know, look at the nutritional quality that has implications positively on your next performance, your next training session. You know on a Monday you're going to be good for nothing anyway. Yeah. So why are you not trying to accelerate that development or sorry, accelerate that recovery? Yeah. 
so that you're ready to perform optimally in seven days time yeah, exactly. I mean that's the mentality of the high level player though isn't it that's yeah. the difference so that, that, I think yeah the basics I think we've nailed down and that's what everyone has to be doing point blank you, you, if you're not doing those three things don't worry about anything else yeah. but th- we both have found some secondary modalities useful so for example I'm thinking I'm going to list a few and which ones stand out to you that you like yeah. so you've got things like recovery pumps you got yoga, massage guns, just general massage, yeah. swimming, um, skins, you know, all these secondary things. What do you think works best? I like all of those things that you've said. You've missed out on the ice hot baths, cold contrast. Cryo, ice yeah, baths, yeah. yeah. I could tell you a story loads, about ice yeah. baths as well, which is quite funny. Go on, I, I mean, <laughs> this goes back to player and athlete or player and coach relationships and trust and all these sort of things as well. Just as a kind of, the, the front load this, you've just listed five or six modalities i always think as a coach nothing should be mandatory so there was a time when ice baths in a club that i used to work for were mandatory not through my doing but one of the other coaches was wanted to kind of impose their methodologies on the player group a coach and a player nearly got into a fight because they were trying the, the coach was trying to get a very high profile player into the ice bath and the the player didn't value the quality of an ice bath as a recovery modality so all of those things have a place within a training program there's times and and there's times in the training week or training calendar where all of those modalities would be great i love personally not just for me but for players um, anyone who takes ownership of their own recovery and makes choices you used to like cryotherapy the science does validate cryotherapy for it used to there was challenges at some point in time whereby uh, practitioners thought that cryotherapy actually blunted the adaptation because they yeah. speeded up recovery process through that metabolic. Uh, so, like, you want that inflammation? You're saying your body. in the preseason, I would say don't use cryotherapy because you need that inflammation, and that helps drive the adaptation that you're trying to create. Would this be the same for ice baths as well? Yes. So, so same. But, yeah. but there's time and a place to apply these these modalities so it's 40 degrees i know we don't really get 40 degrees in the uk very much but ice also well the, the, the back in time ice reduces inflammation it also really rapidly cools your t- core body temperature if you've been playing at 35 degrees in france or 40 degrees in france yeah. you want to get your core body temperature down an ice bath is a applicable a modality at that point mm. so You've, you always weigh, as a practitioner, you're always weighing up the application with the context. Skins, we talked about that at the beginning. They don't, the science doesn't validate their usefulness. So you see a lot of people using them, say, on yeah. planes, don't you? Yeah, like, exactly. Heavier weights that travels if you've got skins. medical grade compression and you've got really tight ones, they can work. Your commercial, don't want to name any names, but, you know, yeah. Skins is a brand. Skins, Canterbury make them, whoever makes, they, there's not enough compression to add a layer of recovery that you're after but the player feels good in them Mm. if the player feels good in them there's a placebo they're going to work because mentally a player feels good mentally a player feels like they're doing everything to recover from either flying or post-match so you've got that placebo you've got that i always i always used to think skins were of value other people would challenge that and obviously science at times does challenge that as well um, the hot cold contrast I loved mm, uh, Craig White you know famous Lions S&C coach went on for three or four Lions tours maybe two or three loves it you know they, you know, the massage the active recovery I love the fact that you've got a dog is amazing the fact that you love taking your dog for a walk mentally depending on whether you've got your phone out and you're doing your Instagram story, which does that many times. <laughs> Sometimes. No, no, you're just trying, to, do, you're trying to do yeah. two things at once, which is absolutely fine. But act, I, really, I really thought for players, active recovery was great. Doing nothing, so you've played and you've refueled on the Saturday, doing nothing on a Sunday, lying on the couch is actually counterintuitive because I think active recovery helps you start that, or accelerate, sorry, that recovery process to the point where you get back to baseline quicker because movement is is a valuable element of recovery Big blood time. flow you know your hips are going to just open up even even if you're moving kind of gingerly and sheepishly you're going to mo- moving is important so i always used to value whether it was on the bike walking a dog walking a dog in the in the in the countryside 
absolute win for ticking off the psychological and physiological benefits of active recovery brilliant swimming depending on your shoulders and how and how much movement you had in them after a game brilliant i mean i like i like pool recovery i also like pool recovery for the fun piece which was boys maybe getting a, a water polo ball or a like yeah, playing, yeah. playing volleyball in the pool yeah, that's a good one um i'll tell you which one that we haven't mentioned yet which is totally totally undervalued and i really i learned this from the rugby uh, from the cricket more than i did from working in rugby fun and laughter yeah i promise you i promise you there's two things that i thought were unbelievable when boys were like showing signs of more mental fatigue than anything else especially cricket where you're playing week in yeah, week out relentless. day in day out it's relentless and you're on buses and this that, and the other comedy clubs yeah. You go to a comedy club and laugh hard for two hours. I promise you, disconnecting, regeneration. I would tick that I box. Agree. I mean, I went, we went and did we went and did a couple of times with the cricket program that I was with, Laser Quest. Yeah. Running, hiding, trying to you know paintballing even. I promise you. I know. I know there's a cost. You're, you're squatting down. I know there's a cost. Out, I know there's a cost implication. Though. You're running. You're, you're getting a sweat Squatting, on, yeah. you're having a laugh when someone gets shot in the bollocks, da, 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 <laughs> you know, all that. Yeah. I promise you, do not undervalue laughter, the movies. Yeah. You go and watch a, a really amazing film. I think the key for recovery, apart from those big rocks we talk about, disconnecting, getting away from distractions. We keep coming back to mobile phones and technologies and getting in front of screen time i know you're watching the screen with maybe with a movie but a lot of things like movies if you choose wisely are about escapism aren't they yeah you know a james bond film or a, or a marvel yeah. movie or whatever i don't know whatever your taste is in films it shouldn't be stressful experience it should be an enjoyable experience where you can just disconnect those things are huge for recovery for me i think the mental side of recovery is massive so that's where yoga um putting you again it goes put your phone away just breathe, you know, get a warm muscle that moves in an extended range and a challenging range for some rugby players because we both know some of them are super tight in various areas for lots of different reasons. We think we've talked before about props who are tight because if they're not tight, the spine's going to bloom and explode. Yeah. But um, I think you hit the nail on the head really with the big rocks are crucial. But I think, like I say, I can't speak highly enough for active recovery. I really like hot, cold contrast. I really love yoga and mobility type stuff. But it's just, it's like everything. It's about being purposeful, isn't it? And also doing what works for you as a player. I think that's an important one, a bit like the ice bath story. It's not my body that needs to recover from this stress. It's yours and how you recover. I mean, some people might like four hours in front of Call of Duty or computer games to unwind. But... We know from a sort of neuroscience network and from a neuroscience perspective, it's actually wiring you, it's not recovering you. I think trying to find those distractions that allow you to disconnect, not get stressed about rugby or the performance. And, you know, I know you use mental skills in the past effectively. I mean, not saying everyone is going to use a mental skills coach, but ultimately having some kind of... Um, framework of okay I, this is what i need to do to mentally and physically recover myself to a point where i can then go back to training or playing you know week in week out on that roller coaster of sport is really really important i think and having a framework that you found effective again it's a bit like the the top 10 exercises for the rest of your life mm. it's a bit like what can i do that has real lasting impact and that some of these recovery modalities are are in that bracket i would not put massage guns the, the sort of easy fixes aren't the win for me it's those habits that kind of you know week to week you're doing all the time are the, are the winners well you said loads there which uh, i've been scribbling down away because i've got so many examples because i completely agree on so like one for you meant to uh, mention the mental skills coach i used and um like somebody walked into my house you have no idea it's my house when i was playing yes. i've got and people used to get me like nice um, big canvas prints of myself playing or sitting in front of an anthem with however many people behind me. And I never used to put them up in the house because when I go home, I don't want to experience emotionally or psychologically those feelings while I'm there. So like, when I go home, I need to be off from rugby. Like you say about switching off. Yeah. And he taught me how to switch off and yeah. get away from it. And yeah. a couple of examples, remember a guy, I was just at some random corporate event and this guy came up to you and he's listening to me do a sort of bit of a speech on 
leadership performance and stuff. And obviously rest was a big part of it because it was coached into me. And he said, oh, I can't switch off from work. I work six, seven days a week. What do I need to do? I was like, you need to, you need to stop. Mm -hmm. And it sounds counterproductive, but you actually be more productive if you take that. You need to go somewhere where you're away from your job. And it's kind of like a form of, of like meditation. So meditation isn't, um, people might think, some people it is, you know, sat down mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. The meditation, I used it about dog walking, and the same skills coach, Andy McCann, who I use, he was chatting to me the other day about this, and it's been proven fact. He said there was a, um, uh, a hospital where there was very, very high-level surgeons who obviously experienced a lot of stress, and there was a room they made where maybe the size of what we're sat in now, but it was all uh, green. They had plants in. They put certain smells in there from, like, woodland and what noises of birds yeah. nothing no tvs nothing it was like a basic like a nature room and they went in they had to they had to sit down in the middle of the day for like 30 minutes and it reduced their stress levels enormously because they're out and he said when you're walking the dogs i love walking the dog you know when people get stressed out they go oh, i'm going for a walk yeah what they don't realize is that's an innate behavioral instinct yeah. because it's been proven when you're out in nature and you're amongst, and you don't realize it because it's subconscious, but you're walking past trees and the shapes of leaves. Because this is the environment that humans have evolved in over the past 100,000, 200,000, millions of years yeah. from primates, right? That's what, you know, this sort of industrial revolution beyond this concrete world we live in is very, it's a fraction of the human lifespan, Correct. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, like, yeah. When you're walking past trees and leaves and you're amongst greenery, that's why hospitals are all neutral colors, like green. You do not realize the, the stress and how it comes down. So when I do go out with a dog, I'll do the odd story, you know, when I'm out with him. But more often than not, I go out, I take my phone, I put it in my pocket, and it's only for emergencies. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not in case the dog runs off. Yeah, but, sure. but I'm no, out. Totally. And you have to, and that's my form of meditation. Yeah. So my point being is, you need to be able to switch off from your sport. You need to find a form of meditation, whether it's yoga. For me, it's walking the dog where I don't speak to anyone. I'll pick a dog walk where without sounding unsociable, I don't want to see anyone. Yeah. I just want to walk, yeah. be a, me and my thoughts. I'm walking through trees yeah. and woodland. Yeah. And even on the point of, there was a golfer I met, I won't say his name, and he was working with the same sports psychologist. And um, he was saying his house, he's got like all this memorabilia in his house and golf stuff and, and the the. The, men, the skills coach was like, you've got to, you've got to stop that. Mm -hmm. you, you live golf every waking hour of your life. You yeah. need to have a hobby. And when yeah. I was younger, I remember thinking like, I picked up a drum kit mm. because I pick up the drums and play the drums. I get lost in the drums for two hours, yeah. but I'm just yeah. escaping yeah. that world of rugby and that yeah. psychological yeah. pressure that's constantly yeah. on. So I just think on your point of getting out, meditation, switching mm. off, it, that's yeah. so undervalued. I know, 100%. And that's why, that's why I know we haven't really mentioned his name much, which is fine. Yeah. Jamie Roberts. Yeah. He's got five degrees. Yeah. So he switched off from rugby yeah. with academic challenge. I mean, the guy's a doctor. He's got an MPhil. He's got an MSc. He's got something else. He's got something else. I mean, I admire that because you're not just, and I, I mean, most of the people living or listening to this won't be professional level players. They might be aspiring to be that. But ultimately, it's having something as a distraction away from your day job that is high pressured it is in the public eye there is high levels of expectancy but something like maybe maybe for someone like jamie and others who've got you know degrees and higher honors and all that sort of stuff academically they needed that to stimulate them away from rugby and also just as a as a distraction and anything like you say walking ledley in the in the woods like you say i can't reinforce enough the same sort of thing from a scientific validation standpoint yeah. mountains the sea rivers yeah, the sea, yeah. they are you know um kerry sweeney another young yeah. a, a decent player played for a long time 40 odd test caps fishing Fish loves going fishing, fishing. Yeah. on his day off go fishing for the day yeah. how cool i mean i've been fortunate enough to go i don't fish on the river i went like when i was a boy i went you know shark fishing out in south africa what a way to spend your time. I, do, I will tell you that we caught the sharks, we threw them back. Yeah, but um, nice. but also, amazing, how to distract yourself away from everyday life. And, rec and that, that is an element of recovery. Being fresh to come back to training, being fresh to be prepared to play at the, at the next weekend. I think the biggest challenge young players have at the moment is all these distractions and not necessarily channeling their on and off button i think learning to, like you've suggested yeah, switching on and off and not being all rugby is absolutely vital for either players playing at the highest level or players aspiring to play at the highest level hobbies are absolutely crucial 
So to finish off as well, this is probably the most um, contro- well, it's not controversial anymore because it's been it's been dispelled. But I'm gonna ask you a question because I think a lot of youngsters think they do this, and I was this guy um, when I was younger as well. Do you have to have a shake within 30 minutes, this anabolic window <laughs> after a gym session? <laughs> Uh, in a word, no. <laughs> I think the challenge the challenge you have, and it's a bit like we've had this conversation around creatine and this loading dose of 20 grams. Mm. Marketing, I think sports, sports nutrition marketing going back probably a generation was all about selling protein and selling creatine. And ultimately it was, oh yeah, you've got to load with 20 grams of protein for optimal. No, we've dispelled that in the creatine type supplementation element. And... We know now that total calories, so I know you, you talk about maintenance doses or maintenance calories, gain weight or, or kind of lose weight or lose fat, whatever it might be. Total calories in a day and fueling in a, in, in a 24 hour cycle. You'd, if we go to the gym straight after this and do an hour's strength training and then don't eat for an hour and a half, the, the muscle ain't going to drop off you. No. <laughs> and this is, this is the funny thing that people think, oh, the, the anabolic window and the gain, my gains, my, my gains, gains, my gains. Ultimately, we, we want a great balance of proteins, carbs, and fats every day and eat nutrients yeah, throughout, the food, day, yeah. throughout the day. If you don't eat for an hour after training, if you weigh 90 kilos now, you're not going to weigh 85 in, in, in an hour and a half's time, are you? As, yeah. uh, ultimately, massive, massive myth. Massive I mean, myth. I, I was that guy. I used to drive around with a protein tub in the car and I'd finish a session. And I'd have to get a shake in. I'd think, oh, it's a waste of a session. But as long as your, your intake or your, like you say your, your diet is sufficient throughout the whole day, it, it doesn't make a difference. But I just thought... There's probably a few teenagers listening, racing to get their protein. And I was that guy. Yeah. I was a professional athlete. I, oh. I remember pro coaches even shouting, don't miss your window, lads, get your shakes in. Yeah. And at the time, yeah, 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 get our shakes in really quick. And it's sort of been dispelled in the last yeah, sort of few years, really. Absolutely. So it's, it's, don't, don't feel like, yeah. you know, you've been an idiot. A lot no. of us believed it. But- Season two, mate. Season two of our pod, we're definitely going to have some, you know, guests, not just you and me talking shop about performance and elite behaviours and all the other things that wrap around that. We're going to have players' perspective. We're going to have nutritionists. Yeah. We're going to have other performance coaches who are going to share their insights as well. Because I think... Actually, this episode particularly is really, really important for what you do. And Fergus Connolly, who worked at the Welsh Rugby Union, now went off to work in other sports in America. He was brilliant about what do you do in the other 20 to 22 hours. So ultimately, even with a, a, a double day of one hour's weight and one hour's worth of rugby, say, you've still got another 22 hours. That's kind of what we've covered here. You can derail your, your kind of progress by living a lifestyle that's not optimal. And I think getting, getting your nutritionist on getting uh, you know the sports yeah. psychologist on to be honest with you giving our listening group a load of people who've got a different perspective on performance will be absolutely absolutely real high value yeah nice no nice one too yeah rest and recovery very important yeah, exactly right